Okay, this video um, is unplanned, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. It's a response video to uh, Bering's questions for feminists, anti-feminists, and others. And I will put a link to the uh, original video in the low bar so that you can actually go and watch it and see what Bering had to say in that video uh, that led to the questions that he asked. Um, he asked two questions but I'm actually going to answer three things because at the very beginning he responded to a, another video. Um, in that video, I'm not going to try to put the video in my video, but in that video uh, it showed a college setting where there are two male roommates and one of them brings home a girl and it's obvious that the roommate that brings home a girl is drunk. He has trouble speaking, he and the girl both have trouble speaking. They're both having trouble walking. Uh, so they're both obviously quite drunk. And the other roommate parents them immediately by asking questions and um, making a suggestion by talking about it as if he's talking about other people. And the suggestion is that, that uh, she sleep somewhere other than with his roommate. And the suggestion is made by stating that sometimes guys take advantage of drunk freshmen, even though his roommate is drunk, and even though uh, his roommate is no more or less capable of decision making at that moment than the girl. So immediately we're put into a situation where the guy is responsible, even though he's drunk, and the girl is not, because she's drunk. And the roommate is considered responsible because he's sober. And he basically just made a sexual choice for his drunk roommate and her, his, his drunk roommate's friend uh, because he was sober and he could. He manipulated him. And the, uh, the drunk guy sends the girl to sleep on the bed and he takes the couch. So my first thought when seeing that was really the person in a scenario that was going to take advantage was the sober guy because he was inflicting his morality on other people without their consent in a situation where by his standards they couldn't consent. If it had been a situation where he felt that they could consent then he wouldn't have been making those statements. He wouldn't have considered it uh, impossible for a drunk girl to consent to sex. The second aspect of that is, obviously, it's an inequality. Because we have the girl being considered unaccountable, but the guy is considered accountable. And they are both clearly drunk. If a person cannot be uh, considered accountable because of their gender, then we must be viewing gender as a handicap. And if we're viewing gender as a handicap, then there is a question that Bering didn't ask that needs to be asked. It's not just do women have the right to get really drunk and have sex? But since women cannot be considered equally accountable to men when they are drinking, do women have the right to get really drunk at all? So in asking the question, do women have the right to get drunk at all, what are we considering? Well, we're looking at the feminist standard for accountability while drunk. And according to the feminist standard for accountability while drunk, men are capable of being considered accountable, they are capable of making responsible choices, and they are to be expected, even while drunk, even while drunk on a level that a woman would be considered too drunk to consent to sex, they are uh, expected to be able to gauge that and respond to it accordingly. Women, on the other hand, even while just a little bit tipsy, are not expected to be able to gauge their degree of drunkenness, what degree of capability they have for decision making, and they're not expected to exercise any kind of responsible decision making. So what we have is a difference in capability, or a handicap. Now, the nature of the handicap that feminists are um, essentially inserting into this and applying only to women is similar to the uh, type of handicap that we attribute to immaturity or being a child. 
They are essentially infantilizing women in this situation. They're claiming that women are less qualified than men in this situation based on intellectual capacity or the capacity to exercise morals and ethics. That being the case, by feminist standards, women do not have the right to drink at all. The same way that children do not have the right to drink at all. Because, according to feminist standards, women can't handle it. Now there's also another aspect of this, and it is related to a man's right to not have an unreasonable demand placed on him. So if you think about the logistics of this, let's imagine for a second that we go on and say, all right, women are handicapped. Being female is a handicap. Women are uniquely incapable of making decisions while drunk. But we're going to let them drink anyway because feminism. They should have the right and the privilege even if they can't live up to it. All right, so going on from there, what is a woman demanding of a man when she asks him to have sex with her after she's been drinking under that circumstance? That's right. She's asking him to risk a rape charge just to have sex with her. Now, I mentioned this in my consent video, which is by far my most viewed video, but I'm not going to assume that the viewer of this video has seen it. Uh, what I basically laid out there is, think about it. If you can withdraw your consent after the fact, then you are asking a man to uh, risk a rape charge just to be with you. You're asking him not only to risk a rape charge, you're asking him to risk the ruin of his reputation, you're asking him to risk the loss of his potential academic path, because if you're in a university with him, you can get him kicked out. You're asking him to risk going through the process of a criminal case, a criminal hearing. You're asking him to risk being convicted of rape. You're asking him to risk imprisonment, you're asking him to risk being assaulted for being a rapist, both in or out of jail. And you're asking him to risk having that mark on his back for the rest of his life. You're asking him to risk being put on a sex offender list, which would require him to have to register as a sex offender with the government. That would also mean all of his neighbors everywhere he moved would be notified this man is a sex offender. It would also mean he would have restrictions on where he could live. It would mean certain employers wouldn't be interested in hiring him, and he would have restrictions on which jobs he would be qualified for. Because you cannot, after being convicted of a crime, get certain jobs. You would also be asking him to risk going a lifetime without being able to be in a relationship with anybody else. Because as soon as a man gets the label rapist slapped on him, other women are going to be afraid to be with him. So, what makes you think you're worth it, lady? So, legally speaking, there isn't anything to stop a woman from getting really drunk and having sex. Legally speaking, a woman isn't going to be prosecuted for that. A woman faces no legal consequence at all. If she gets pregnant, she can have an abortion. If she doesn't like what happened later on, if she feels like, you know, her reputation is shot because she got drunk and had sex, or she realizes that she made a bad decision and she cheated on somebody, or she had not planned on doing this because she didn't want to lose her virginity, or for whatever reason, she's upset. Later on, she's like, I didn't want to do this. Rape! You know, there's not any kind of legal consequence that she's going to face for that. Only the man faces that consequence. So legally, a woman has the right. Legally, a woman's right is not infringed on at all in this circumstance. A man's right is. A man's right to expect that if someone agrees to do something with him and engages in an activity actively with him, that their actions are as important as their words, even when they're drunk. Now, I would compare this to a fist fight. If I get drunk and I go out and slug someone in the jaw and they hit me back, it doesn't become not self-defense because I later say I was drunk and I didn't consent to that. 
But if I get drunk and I go out and I have sex with someone, if I get drunk and I take my clothes off and I take his clothes off and, and we have sex and I'm actively participating the whole time and later on I say, I couldn't consent to that because I was drunk. There are people who would differentiate. Even though both choices are active choices in which I am taking a physically active part. I'm not just speaking. I'm not just giving verbal consent. My choice is to use my body to do something. Whatever happened to the feminist, my body, my choice uh, mantra. Now, on the other hand, ethically, because I am making that request that I described, that I am demanding that a man take a risk, that later on I'm going to come back and go back on my word and go back on my actions and, and accuse him of being a rapist, if I'm asking him to take that risk, then no, ethically, I don't have the right to get drunk and have sex. Not by feminist standards. Not really by legal standards. And the only way that women can earn that right is to stand up to feminists and stand up to white knights and say, yes, we can be equally accountable to men. The only way that we actually have ethically the right to get really drunk and have sex is if we are willing to force society to treat us as if we made that decision ourselves. Because we did. It's only if we fight to eliminate the legal risk to a man. And only if we fight to roll back the authoritative risk that men face on, on university campuses. Only if we fight back against feminist infantilization of women can women truly be said to ethically have the right to get really drunk and have sex. And until we do that, the answer is no, we don't. Okay, now bearing second question, um, I already sort of discussed with Stacy King, and she talked about our discussion a little bit in her video, and so I'm going to link to that in the low bar. Um, I'm going to talk about it a little further here, but first I'm going to read the question, so you're going to see me turn away from the camera a little bit. Uh, Baring asks, Is there any other deed or activity that two people can partake in, completely, legitimately, and legally from start to finish, that is subject to being deemed illegitimate and illegal, should one of the participants declare it so at any time in the future? Well, um, when I talked about this with Stacy King, I talked about it in terms of the penalties a man can face in a divorce. Because a marriage is legal and legitimate from start to finish. And, you know, if you never get divorced, obviously it's, it's till death do you part. It's completely legitimate the whole time. But if you do get a divorce, only one gender faces significant risk of penalty. The other gender doesn't. And I say that even though some women forego careers should be stay-at-home moms, because if a woman makes that choice, she is able to rely on a man's income to supplement her uh, in her, uh, if she chooses at least, to try to recover some of her earning capacity. She can even choose not to recover her earning capacity and expect him to support her until she marries another man who's willing to support her. She can expect to be considered the legitimate parent uh, out of two parents who are legitimate, even though um, the, the court standard doesn't say that the mother is the legitimate parent and the father is not a legitimate parent after the divorce. She can expect to collect child support, and she can expect to collect alimony, as I said. Um, she also can expect the community around her to treat him as the failure in the marriage. And uh, she can expect that if she makes life choices that are financially unsound, that the court will hold him responsible. For instance, in Ohio, if a man and a woman get divorced, and they have children, and she has custody, and he's paying child support, the formula that that's based on 
once that's all set and established, if she has another child with another man after that marriage is over, the formula changes. The original formula takes the family's total income, mother and father, and sets aside a a percentage of it as the uh, parent's obligation financially towards the children. And then out of that total, whatever percentage the mother earns versus whatever percentage the father earns, um, that's the percentage of that overall obligation to the children that they're considered legally responsible for. So if the father's paying child support, his child support obligation is supposed to be a a percentage of that percentage, if you follow me. Um, And there are factors that mitigate that, which I'll get into in a second. But if the mother has another child with another man, the state reduces her obligation toward her children from the divorce and by default increases the father's obligation. So, in other words, if she has a child by another man after divorcing, the father of the two children from the divorce ends up paying more child support. Doesn't that sound like he's paying child support to his ex-wife for her child with another man? Now, there are some things, some factors that can can mitigate that. Like if the woman has never had a job, they count her as being able to earn minimum wage. On the other hand, men face something even more uh, significant. A woman's child support might be able to be slightly reduced by the fact that she can be counted as being able to earn minimum wage. A man's child support obligation can be significantly increased by something called imputed income, in which the judge decides that he should be making more money than he is, or that if the wife says he has a source of income that she can't prove he has, the judge can assume that he has that money and demand that he share it, even if there is no evidence at all that it exists. So a man can be demanded to pay a significantly greater amount of money than the state legally allows to be confiscated from his existing job. And if he cannot keep up with that, then he faces significant penalties. And some of those penalties can actually impact his ability to earn money and pay his child support. For instance, a man who fails to keep up with his child support, even if he is making payments and he is simply behind or slow or making at a smaller rate than the court thinks he should be making his payments, um, he can have his driver's license taken away. If driving is his only way to get to work, then he can lose his job. The judge does not have to take into consideration that he has lost his job. The judge does not have to reduce his child support because he lost his job. Um, if he loses his job and he doesn't pay any child support, then he can go to jail. If he goes to jail, he becomes less employable. And of course, the cycle continues. Another issue with this is if the state is confiscating a high percentage of a man's income, it leaves him nothing to live on. So he can run out of money to pay for his car, he can run out of money to pay for public transportation, he can run out of money to pay his housing. I've seen men reduced to 10 to 15 percent of their actual income for living expenses by child support obligations. And uh, I've seen men have family members have to help pay them their child support. I personally was asked by the state to sign a consent form to have my uh, tax refund seized to pay my husband's child support obligation. And I was told that I had to say on that consent form that I was not being coerced into signing the consent form. At the same time, I was told by the Child Support Enforcement Agency that if I didn't sign that paper, my husband would go to jail. But that's not coercion. And, of course, my consent is valid no matter what. So marriage can very much be considered a an arrangement that is completely legitimate and legal the entire time. But as soon as a woman wants out of it, a man can be punished for having been involved. And that's just financial punishment. I haven't even talked about 
the emotional pain and suffering that a man goes through, not just when he's abandoned by the person that he has dedicated the, his entire life to, to being with, um, dedicated his heart and his labor to supporting her, uh, dedicated his, you know, his loyalty, um, and not just to the point of not dating other women, but we all know that many women expect men to give up their friends. Many women come between men and their biological families. Uh, your whole life changes when you get married. And women maintain a greater degree of freedom on the whole in a marriage than a man does. So this is a situation where a man has given up quite a bit that doesn't get in, taken into consideration by, uh, by a woman. Uh, and, and, and then she just throws it away. And I, I can say it like that because the majority of divorces are initiated by women. And many of them do initiate because they get bored. And that's not to discount abusive situations. It's not to discount adultery situations. I'm talking about the majority. Um, and the other thing about this is, of course, men who have children, even if things were really over between them and the woman, even if they were cheating, even if uh, the, the, the couple really needed to be apart, having your children taken away from you, and in a divorce situation, most men do, is getting to see your, your, your kids uh, every other weekend for a couple of days, that's not anywhere near comparable to living with them. Even 50-50 custody, which, which women are now complaining about, feminists are now complaining about, um, that's tough on both parents and the kids. So there's a situation where men are getting penalized all around when they get divorced. They really get pummeled. Um, and I would, I would call that uh, an answer to that question. So hopefully I've answered all of it. Um, and any further discussion anybody is interested in having, please let me know. And uh, I will get back to my regularly scheduled videos shortly, probably after the uh, meetup that takes place this Saturday. And if you want to see more about the meetup, um, I'll leave a link to that in the low bar as well. In the meantime, if you're female and you're offended by this video, man up. Learn to deal with what a man lives with, and uh, maybe you'll be able to consider these questions from a more egalitarian standpoint.